We'll, we'll start it on two minutes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Want to come up? What? Want to come up? Or no? Do I want to come up? Yeah. Or do you, would you rather stay there? Oh, yeah. Huh? Would you rather stay there? Are we starting right now? Yeah, we're going to start. So, hi everyone. Good evening. Um, week three. Thanks for being here. I know it's Halloween. I know some may have parental responsibilities. You're going to race out of here like I will after this. Um, you know, after the last class, I was thinking to myself, well, I'm just presenting all this bad, heavy stuff. Like, it's overwhelming, I know. I'm sure many of you are thinking that it might be overwhelming as well. Um, and you're not alone. I, I can tell you I've had conversations before class, and I, I know that in the readings there are examples of alternative economies that people are creating, alternative approaches to, to farming, to creating farm businesses, to creating food businesses, and there are glimmer, like there are responses, there are policies that are being promoted out there that are chipping away at the food system that I am presenting. Tonight I am going to continue to present a food system that is extractive, and tonight we're going to focus on its impacts on people. Um, we're going to look at who controls our food supply, what role race has historically in this country played and continues to play to exacerbate that extractive model. We're going to look at who harvests our food, and then we're going to have a guest speaker, Keanu Mickey, the executive director of Just Food, to help walk us through viewing far, the farm bill and far, food policy through a different lens. Um, I know last week someone was raised their hand and rather than asking a qu question, <coughs> presented a, their opinions and their ideas. Beautiful. That's what we want here. So any Q&A is, is really discussion. Um, I want everyone to be engaged. There's expertise in this room. There's personal knowledge in this room. There's personal feelings in this room. We're all processing this information together. Let's, let's do that together. I, I, I want to encourage that as much as possible. Um, before we dive into tonight's class, I'm going to ask Aura to come on up um, and talk about her what she did for the assignment. <coughs> So hey guys, um, I'm not an overachiever. I actually get paid to do this as part of my job. So, um, uh, so this perfectly drawn circle that you guys see down here at the bottom is actually uh, that's the half mile radius around where I live. So I live in a heavily industrial area in the South Bronx, and. Um, when I started taking on this project, I was looking at first at just like the places that I could walk to. Um, my job is right about here, so I'm just like a 10 minute, uh, like on this block, yeah, it's like a 10 minute walk from my home. So all of these places in here I'm really familiar with, and I started kind of mapping them. I figured it'd be easier to put it onto a Google map as opposed to trying to draw one because you see my art skills with that circle, right? Um, so. When I started working on this, I put it onto my work computer and I started talking to a couple of people from my office. I work for New York Common Pantry with their Policy Systems and Environments Division. So part of the work that we do is really looking at accessibility when it comes to food. And as I started mapping some of the things that were just within my little circle, I started talking to some of the other people who work at different locations around the, around the Bronx or do nutrition education at schools. And I asked them when you're out and about, if you walk past a food place, if you could just you know, make a little note of what block it was on. And then when you get back to the office, just let me know. So we started to expand our map out to include more in the places, more of the places in the South Bronx that uh, we work in. And we all started kind of like collectively putting this map together. And as part of it, we actually started separating out things that were specifically healthy options that are highlighted in purple. Um, our supermarkets were in black and then uh, the biggest you know we have a few a few of our little farmers markets with about three or four stands in total um, and then we get into our bodegas which tend to be the largest um, selection of food options that we have so uh, you can imagine that you know in most of the bodegas you're going to find a lot of highly processed foods packaged foods some of them have like the sandwiches to order and things like that but a lot of it is deli meats and prepackaged meats and things like that. Um, so those are the things that we have accessible and while they're more affordable and obviously much more robust than some of the other food options, 
Um, they're not necessarily the healthiest options available to our community. Um, a lot of them do accept things like EBT cards um, and food stamps, which is really which is really helpful. But again, a lot of the food is like processed and packaged, so there are limitations on it. Um, and then uh, we also started mapping in some of the restaurants and stuff in the area, and as you can see, there are a lot of those as well. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to try and layer into it, which is kind of all the way up towards the top of this, let's excuse my scrolling, um, is physical activity options. So we focus a lot on you know, access, on food choices, affordability, and then overall physical activity. And so we focus that for like the South Bronx area, and you can see all of those in yellow. <coughs> Compared to the amount of food options that we have, there are much, much less in the realm of actual options for physical activity. Within the half mile radius of my home and further expanded to include the South Bronx, um, there's like, there's not a gym. So like a, an actual like gym in my radius did not exist. So even though there is a lot of food, there aren't many healthy options. Um, and there's a lot of cheap food, but it's not necessarily quality food. So there's definitely quantity, but not so much quality. Um, so yeah, it was a collective effort. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So with these assignments, like the food diary and the sort of the community food assessment, Keep doing, I and mean, obviously these assignments are not graded assignments uh, in any way. Um, but just to, again, to be focusing and be aware, and it will help raise questions and, and help stir consciousness. Um, <clears throat> so on to our present topic for tonight. I told you we were gonna revisit this slide last week, so just to paint, paint the landscape. Uh, in the Ag Census from 2012, identified 2.1 million farms in the U.S. 97% are individually owned and 3% are corporate owned. 88% of all of, of, or small farms, and that's uh, the USDA defines a small farm not by acreage, but by gross income, and that's th less than $350,000. Mid-size and large farms accounted for 9% of farms. And then what we're going to sort of be talking about tonight is that the 88% of farms, which are those small farms, 88% of, of all farms own about 48% of all farmland and of the value of farm real estate. What we looked at last week, they, they bring it that 88% of farmers account for 80% of gross farm income, but only 5% of farm profit. All right, so 12% of farms are responsible for 95% of farm profitability in the U.S. And most farms are not profitable. Food has been, yes? Are the small farms clustered in a particular region in the U.S.? Um, I don't know, actually. Uh, I am going to assume that they are on the, the east and west coasts, mm -hmm. and that in the Midwest, and even in parts of California, you're going to have massive farms mm -hmm. in California. But throughout, throughout the, um, yeah, I would imagine that m more, and in the south, smaller farms bringing in smaller farm, sm uh, less income. But I will answer that last week, next week. And someone asked me a question last week about when did cows start eating corn, and I said you, I would answer it. So cows have been eating corn, there's evidence even before 1900, but we really started feeding our cows massive amounts of corn after World War II when our farm policy switched from really supporting farmers to really promoting production of, of cheap food. Thank you. Yeah. Um, just a, a question about like, the acreage of land. So with the farms that are How many are how many acres are in that eighty eight percent? Yeah, versus the I will have that answer to you before the end of tonight. All right. Um, 
what, what I, we do know is that the four largest pork packers, beef packers, soybean crushers, and wet corn processors, control between 90, 71 and 86 percent of the supply chain. When you look at grains, it's even more consolidated. Four companies own over 90 percent over of the global grain trade. And you read for this week that through mergers and acquisitions, there's actually less publicly traded companies today than there were 20 years ago, because there's been so much mergers and acquisition, which created vertical integration, which means these companies literally control every stage of the food chain. And they're controlling the inputs that farmers are bringing onto their farms, what chicks they're buying, when, when to water, when to feed, what the prices are, the packaging, the processing, the distribution. And what that has led to is that the farmer's share of the food dollar in 1950 was about 41 percent, 41 cents of every dollar, and today it's less than 15 cents. It's about 15 cents of every dollar. At the same time, companies, this is, these are the 2017 numbers. General Mills last year brought in $15.74 billion of gross revenue with a $2 billion profit. ConAgra brought in nearly $8 billion in profit. JBS, which is the largest um, meat, global meat company, brought in $51 billion with $167 million in gross profit, in, in net profit, sorry, and I'm going to revisit them later on. And Cargill brought in 114, uh, almost $115 billion in gross profit with a net profit of $3 billion. So companies are getting rich, right? And as a result, in that same time, we've seen a significant loss of the number of farms. So again, you see in that 1940-1950 area, U.S. farm policy really shifted from supporting farmers to moving into supporting the corporations um, that make cheap food. And that has resulted in farmers becoming more and more reliant on off-farm income. So with the small farms, 84% of, of small farms depend on outside employment for the majority of their household income. Farming is not a profitable enterprise for them. And that, the next stat is that 38% of primary operators of small farms have a primary occupation that is not farming. So every day they are at another job, which is their primary source of income, and then they come home to farm. And again, this is just highlights the stat I said before, that the farmer's share of the food dollar continues to decline. And I, we're about to celebrate, some of us may celebrate Thanksgiving in the coming weeks, and this highlights the, the farmer's share of our food plate, right? So a farmer um, that's producing sweet corn and is selling it through Del Monte, and that sweet corn ends up on our, on our plate, they're getting 2.8 cents of every, every, doll, every food dollar. So 2.8% of that food dollar goes to the farmer. For the ha smoked ham, it's 15 cents on the dollar. The sweet potato, it's 7, 7 cents, 7.38 cents. This is the reality of who is pr the, the, pr the growers of our food who are supplying what we're what we're eating and consuming on a daily basis. Yeah. This is this is not farmers market farmers. This is like farmers selling. Correct. This is this is this is not direct retail. Okay. The, in fact, the direct retail farmer is seeing a different economic reality. Um, and I know that we talked about me presenting these incredibly depressing statistics uh, throughout hour after hour. This morning I read. Um, an article that, that popped up, and 30% um, of all farmers in the U.S. are women, are women, and women out-earn men in agriculture. It's one of, one of 10 industries in the U.S. where women out-earn men, and that's because they are more open to diversification, thinking about alternative models like CSAs and selling direct retail through farmers markets. So their average um, salary, annual salary is a, is a few thousand dollars higher than the men who tend to be uh, growing 
more conventionally. Yeah? Why is the apple cider and the carrot considerably higher than the other prices for the farmers? So, apple cider, in a lot of farms are able to process apple cider on farm. Um, so it gives them, they're, they're doing their own processing and it gives them the, the higher percentage. And ones that don't, the apples that they're sending to, um, to the processor, they're, it's a secondary use for those apples. Those apples are, would not make grade. They're either too small or they're imperfect. So they have to pick them anyway. And so it's the, because they're making profit on the other apples that they're selling, it, it accounts for a higher percent or a higher return on what they're, what they're selling into the wholesale market. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, what does the economic reality for a farmer's market farmer look like in terms of like their actual annual income and just how much that benefits them versus the situation? So I will get into that a lot more on, in our last, on our, in the class six, and you will hear from a farmer who sells through markets as well. Um, we say that the farmer do, the farmer's share of the food dollar that's selling direct is between 75 and 90 cents on the dollar. Yeah. Can you quote uh, the range between that last article you referenced about women making more money than men? Like, how much more money? I'll give you the numbers. I like that. Can you repeat that question? If he could quote the difference between what women are out-earning out male farmers in the modern world. So the, the, week, the weekly, this is according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 2017, the weekly median salary for women in agriculture was $1,114, and for men it was $963. Yeah. So the trend has been that retail prices over the last 15 years have increased. And that is this line, right? And this is the share of the farmer dollar. So even though retail prices have gone up and up, the farmer is earning less and less, right? And the result is that in the last 15 years, net farm income, and this is mostly, again, for the, for the farms that are supplying the industrial food system, they've seen a 50% reduction in net income. That's not profit, that's income. So farmers are going out of business. Ray, you asked before, are we, are we, is there, are we approaching a, a farmer crisis like we saw in the 80s? Farmers are, are losing, literally losing their shirts. We're seeing an elevated rate of farm suicide and farms going out of business. There's a dairy crisis in our state. And at the same time, we saw, I told you what the profits were of General Mills and ConAgra and JBS. That 167 million net profit of JBS in 2017 was a 128% increase in profit from, the, from 2016. So our food companies are seeing significant profits while our farmers are going out of business. And for last week, what? yes? What happened in 2013? Because it looks like such a drastic and precipitous as opposed to uh, uh, in that last slide, as opposed right. to Right, that's when, um, <coughs> I don't know. Next week. Next week, or later today. Um, for last, for last week, you, had, you read the article about the poultry operations, um, and it was called the zombie article. Mm -hmm. And in it, in terms of how this, what this looks like in real life, right, it takes about a million dollar investment to build, to upgrade facilities, to build new facilities, and for the carrying costs of an operation, of a poultry operation per year. And yet those, the farmer receives between five and six cents per pound for the product that they're for, that they're they're raising, right? And most poultry operations now raise over five hundred thousand birds. That's the average. And so we went, we lost ninety eight point five percent of our poultry growers in the last sixty years, and yet we've seen a fourteen hundred percent increase 
and the number of birds that we're raising. Mm. <clears throat> and our farmers are essentially indentured servants, right? They are totally controlled by who they're selling their product, who, who is in control of, the, of their operation. So if they're selling to Purdue, Purdue is telling that, that poultry farmer is controlling, uh, again, literally 99.5% of what that farmer is doing and how they're operating. And yet they're classified as independent contractors. So that means the farmer takes all the risk, does, does, borrows all the upfront money, doesn't get workers' comp because they're an independent contractor, doesn't get health benefits because they're an independent contractor, and they are an interchangeable supplier along the chain. Yes? smaller um, operations, so like Hanson Brothers and, and Red Wizard, mm -hmm. who have similar models where they've been working with groups of farmers. Right. Um, I'm assuming that the way that the relationship is more equitable, but what, what, when you describe it, it sounds very similar to that. So they're, those are much smaller companies, right. and they probably exert some control over growing practices, mm -hmm. but it is, it's a different re it is a different relationship than one of the larger corporations um, that is really controlling everything from input to distribution. So um, they do exert some control over their operations. They're going to have food safety op requirements. They're going to have feed requirements. I'm sure they're going to have uh, requirements related to whether there's path, whether whatever the claim is from pasture to cage free to number of birds they're growing at a certain time. But it's a, it is a more equitable relationship. Uh, that, that said, those poultry supply, those, those egg suppliers are still very much dependent on the Hanson Brook and are not setting their own are, are not setting their own prices. I mean, it's, it is very much um, the law of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Where a poultry farmer or an egg producer has the ability to shop around their product they're going to be able to demand a higher price. Where there is less, in fact, one of the, the stats that we read for this week, where there is less competition and less available jobs, it, the direct result is a 17% decrease in income. So another real life implication is that workers along the food chain, and this does not, this graph, includes more than just farmers, but workers along the food chain rely disproportionately larger numbers than other industries on public assistance. And while I don't have the specific stat on farmer breakdown, we do know that rural households have a larger percent of total households that are relying on SNAP. It's 14.6% in rural households, of rural households, versus 13.8% of households in small cities, versus 10.9% in large cities. So that's the broad picture of who controls our food system. Yeah? Does all this poultry that gets produced get consumed? No. So what happens? It gets thrown away. Yeah. And it, again, it is that system of mass mass production, producing as much as you can, that, is, that leads to a food waste situation that we talked about last week. Yeah? I think it's also important to name mass production as capitalism. Absolutely. Just like saying it. At, at, things that, like, that dictates all of that movement that you're saying, that constant production, that constant needing of like whatever amount, these arbitrary numbers, because the $2 billion of profit doesn't go into Medicaid and these households so they can support themselves right. into pockets of people who will never meet. So I wasn't allowed to have any book as a required reading, but I really do strongly urge you to read A Foodie's Guide to Capitalism. It's on the list. It's Eric Holt Jimenez. Um, and it, it's what you just described. So we're going to move on and talk about how race exacerbates this extractive model in our, of our food system. 
And I want to tell you that I am not in any way an expert on dismantling racism in our food system or on addressing working with privilege in our food system. There are names on our, on our syllabus, Leah Penniman at Soul Fire Farm, Eduardo Gonzalez in the Opening Doors Diversity Project, who have that expertise. And I encourage everyone here to pursue those uh, organizations and individuals if you want to really engage in these issues. Um, and if there are others that you all know of and you want to email me, I can blast that out to the group. Um, but that said, we're about to watch a 35 minute video that talks about the um, history of how this country has made decisions around citizenship, around uh, land access, around um, lending practices, around housing. And we can't talk about public policy and we can't talk about interventions until we have a historical context of the structures that have been put in place intentionally over time that has favored white wealth over wealth for individuals and communities of color. Um, so we're going to watch this for the next 35 minutes, and then I'll bring it back and talk about, how, the, again, real-life examples of how this plays out. Major funding for this program provided by the Ford Foundation, a resource for innovative people and institutions worldwide, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding provided by these funders. perceive as race is one of the first things we notice about each other. Skin, darker or lighter. Eyes, round or almond. Blue, black, brown. Hair, curly, straight, blonde or dark. And attached to these characteristics is a mosaic of values, assumptions and historical meanings. Even those of us who claim we don't believe the stereotypes can easily recite them. The average person on the street thinks that race consists of differences in physical appearance. They also think that from looking at a person's physical appearance that they can find out or know more subtle things about them. Race is not a level of biological division that we find in anatomically modern humans. There are no subspecies in the human beings that live today. And that's quite shocking to a lot of individuals. When you look and you think you see race, to be told that no, you don't see race, you just think you see race, that you know, it's based on your cultural lens, that's extremely challenging. Just because race isn't a biological reality doesn't mean it isn't real. Being classified as Asian or black or Latino has never carried the same advantages in our society as being white. Race in itself means nothing. The markers of race, skin color, hair texture, the things that we identify as the racial markers mean nothing unless they are given social meaning and unless there's public policy and private actions 
that act upon those kinds of characteristics. That creates race. Physical differences don't make race. What makes race are the laws and practices that affect life chances and opportunities based on those differences. If we look carefully, we can see how our institutions and policies have assigned racial identities and reinforced racial inequality throughout the 20th century. And this is something I think that all immigrant groups experience in one way or another when they come to America, no matter what point in time it is, because they come to a country that has historically always been highly racialized. It's a country where race has its origins in uh, slavery, um, as well as in the uh, conquest of Native American Indians. So anybody coming from the outside after that point has to fit into this racialized society in some way. And it's not always clear how people are going to fit in right away. At the start of the 20th century, as millions of immigrants arrived from all over the world, lawmakers and social scientists debated how all of them, including the new European arrivals, would fit into the hierarchy of races already here. They came seeking economic opportunity, freedom, and a future for their families. Of the 23 million newcomers between 1880 and 1920, the vast majority were from Eastern and Southern Europe. Immigrants often work the hardest, poorest paying and most dangerous jobs, along with the so-called inferior races already here. Blacks, Mexicans, and Chinese. Cities with enormous slums developed as the ugly side of industrialization. Ugly both in terms of the aesthetic of American cities, but also ugly in terms of the, the solidifying of class differences and class tension. As all of those things became apparent, uh, the immigrant became the symbol for, for what America might be becoming. By 1910, 58% of American mining and factory workers were immigrants. Like Mexicans and African Americans, Italians, Slavs, and Jews were often desired as laborers, but also feared seen as promiscuous, lazy, or stupid. Some saw it as a racial invasion. Charles Davenport, a famous biologist, expressed those fears in 1911. The population of the United States, wrote Davenport, will, on account of the great influx of blood from southeastern Europe, rapidly become darker in pigment smaller in stature, more given to crimes of larceny, kidnapping, assault, murder, rape, and sexual immorality. And the ratio of insanity in the population will rapidly increase. And this was also a time when scientific race theory began to take off, and people began to uh, look at society and look at at groups of people in more racialized terms. So people were perceived as, as being separate races. So you had kind of a higher order of white races, you know, which were seen as the Nordics, as opposed to what many of the nativists called the lower races of Europe. Their 
various groups like the American Breeders Association, the Eugenics Research Association, who not only are doing research on various racial types, in this case, Hebrews, Slavs, Mediterraneans, what we would call now the Caucasian race, I would break it down to 35 or 37 or 45 races for study and a lot of the language was beginning to get at the idea that those differences were actually uh, rooted in, in reproduction. They were rooted in inheritable traits. They were heritable. They were biological. They were immutable. The more the newcomers were forced into low-paying jobs and diseased tenements, the more these conditions were explained as natural consequences of their innate racial character. Biology was destiny. Which side of the racial divide you found yourself on could be a matter of life or death. Between 1890 and 1920, 2,500 African Americans were lynched in the South. In 1915, Leo Frank, a Jew living in Atlanta, was pulled from jail and hanged by a mob for allegedly killing a white girl. Writing about the lynching, a black journalist wondered, is the Jew a white man? Some historians have suggested that these new immigrant groups from Europe uh, were in between peoples. They were in a transitional stage when compared to uh, Anglo-Saxon Protestants, groups such as Italians um, or Jews, were seen as not being fully white, perhaps. But when compared to African Americans or were compared to Asians, um, their whiteness became more salient, became more visible. Could European ethnics become fully white? and thus fully American. By 1910, a new term was entering popular culture to describe the transformation of Europeans. The phrase came from the title of a Broadway play by Israel Zangwill. God, said Zangwill, would melt down the races of Europe into a single pure essence, out of which he would mold Americans. So when the Irish when Germans, when Italians were coming and they didn't speak the language, they didn't know the culture, the idea was they will assimilate into Americanhood. They will become American, which in the American tradition has meant white American. But that melting pot never included people of color. Blacks, Chinese, Puerto Ricans, etc., could not melt into the pot. They could be used as wood to <laughs> produce the fire for the pot, but they could not be used as material to be melted into the pot. Whiteness was key to citizenship. In 1790, Congress had passed an act declaring that only free white immigrants could become naturalized citizens. After the Civil War, naturalization was extended to persons of African descent as well. But it was the white citizen who had clear access to the vote, sat on juries, was elected to public office, and <coughs> had better jobs. Whiteness was not simply a matter of skin color. To be white was to gain the full rewards of American citizenship. In order to be a naturalized citizen in this country, you had to be categorized as white or black. And almost everybody who tried to naturalize, all but I think one case that went to the Supreme Court, all of them were people trying to be categorized as white. So the court had to make decisions about who was white and who was not. Courts and legislators had long been in the business of conferring racial identities in the South to enforce Jim Crow segregation and laws against mixed marriages, courts had to first determine who was black under law. And here's where it really gets interesting. You got some places, for example, Virginia, Virginia law defined a black person as a person with one sixteenth African ancestry. 
Now, Florida defined a black person as a person with one-eighth African ancestry. Now, Alabama said, you're black if you've got any black ancestry, any African ancestry at all. But you know what this means? You can walk across a state line and literally, legally change race. Now, what does race mean under those circumstances? You give me the power, I can make you any race I want you to be because it is a social political construction. In 1909, American courts had that power. That year, the US Court of Appeals in Massachusetts ruled that Armenians, often classified as Asiatic Turks, were legally white. If Armenians could be designated white, what of the other so-called Asiatic races? Filipinos, Syrians, the Japanese. Could they also petition successfully to be designated white by the courts? and thus become Americans? In 1922, when Japanese businessman Takao Ozawa petitioned the Supreme Court for naturalization, many in the Japanese community believed his was the perfect test case. Takao Ozawa came from Japan, went to the University of California at Berkeley, uh, for a few years, then moved to Hawaii where he had um, a family, and he applied to become a naturalized citizen in 1915. My father wrote his own brief and everything, and he was really uh, devoted. He wanted to become an American citizen, and nothing would stop him. He was determined. Japanese growers in California watched Ozawa's case closely. By 1920, a series of alien land acts prohibited many non-citizens from owning or leasing land. Without a legal designation of whiteness to make them citizens, Japanese immigrants could not have the full protection of American law, no matter how long they lived in the country. In his brief, Azawa argued that his skin was as white as any so-called Caucasian, if not whiter. But he made a much more important second argument. But a second argument was that race shouldn't matter for citizenship. What really mattered was a person's beliefs. My honesty and industriousness are well known among my Japanese and American friends. In name, Benedict Arnold was an American, but at heart he was a traitor. In name, I am not an American, but at heart, I am a true American. The articles would come out in the paper. I thought, oh, what did he do, you know? I thought only bad things came out in the paper, and I was kind of ashamed, you know, when I was a child. And it was just the way we were brought up. I didn't have any Oriental friends. My neighbors were all Caucasian. And so he was so determined to get us, well, when the time came to be American citizens. The Supreme Court ruled that Ozawa could not be a citizen. Uh, they said he was not white within the meaning of the statute and therefore not eligible to citizenship. And the court said, well, he's not white because he's not Caucasian and Caucasians are whites. He did everything right. He learned English. He had a lifestyle that was American. He went to Christian church on Sunday. He dressed as a Westerner. He brought up his children. Um, as Americans. He did everything he was supposed to do, and, and yet he's told that he can't be a citizen because he's not white. The court ruled that according to the best known science, Ozawa was not Caucasian, but of the Mongolian race. 
that the court would not be bound by science in policing the boundaries of whiteness. Only three months after Azawa, the court took up the case of Bhagat Sin Thind, a South Asian immigrant and U.S. Army veteran who petitioned for citizenship on the grounds that Indians were of the Aryan or Caucasian race, and therefore white. And he makes the scientific argument, um, having learned something actually from the Azawa case, that he is Caucasian. He gets scientific authority to speak on his behalf, that in fact South Asians are included in the Caucasian race. So here the court was in a bind because they were presented with so-called scientific evidence that Indians were Caucasian. And the court solved this problem by saying that it didn't matter what science said, so-called science. They actually said white is not something that can be scientifically determined, but white is something that is subjectively understood by who they call the common person, the common man. It may be true, reasoned the court, that the blonde Scandinavian and the brown Hindu have a common ancestor in the dim reaches of antiquity, but the average man knows perfectly well that there are unmistakable and profound differences between them today. The same court that used science to determine whiteness in Ozawa three months before now refuted its own reasoning in Thind. Thind might well be Caucasian, the High Court said, but he was not white. The justices never said what whiteness was, only what it wasn't. Their implied logic was a circular one. Whiteness was what the common white man said it was. The court often decided who was white and who wasn't based on whether they just felt that the person would politically fit well into the kind of society that we were trying to build. And sometimes it was pretty explicit that this is what the court was doing. There was widespread racial views that Asians were undesirable, that they threatened to contaminate the American society. Basically that Asians are too different, that they can never really become like the rest of us. The consequences of the unanimous verdict in U.S. versus Thind were catastrophic for the Indian community. South Asians who had naturalized before the verdict were stripped of their citizenship and property. Vashno Das Begai was a successful merchant who fled British tyranny in India to raise his family in a free country. After his American citizenship was revoked, he took his own life. He left a suicide note for his family and another for the public. But now they come and say to me, I am no longer an American citizen. What have I made of myself and my children? We cannot exercise our rights. We cannot leave this country. Humility and insults, blockades this way, and bridges burned behind. For the Japanese community, the verdicts in the Azawa and Thin cases were equally devastating. Now, as aliens ineligible for citizenship, many growers were unable to purchase or even lease land to stay in business. Thousands of acres were seized from Japanese immigrants and sold to white farmers. By the time the racial requirement for naturalization was finally removed in 1952, Takawa Ozawa was long dead. The notion that Asians are racially unassimilable and that they're ineligible to citizenship uh, because of their race is something that I think has had uh, a real enduring uh, effect. The fact that they were seen as non-American 
enabled many Americans to see them as, uh, as the enemy and to strip them totally of their civil liberties and to put them in, in internment camps during World War II. The legacy of this idea is that um, even those who are third or fourth generation Asian Americans are still perceived as foreigners. In 1924, Congress passed the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act, which effectively banned Asian immigration until 1965. Johnson-Reed also cut immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe to a trickle. Your blood's the same as mine, mine's the same as his. Do you know what this wonderful country is made of? It's made up World War II found the U.S. at war with Nazi Germany and Japan. Films like the 1945 Oscar-winning short, The House I Live In, called for national unity and ethnic tolerance. What is America to me? And these other uh, distinctions which had carried so much power in an earlier period, the Celt, Slav, Anglo-Saxon, uh, started to fade away. There was, they had no purchase because those distinctions didn't seem to hold the key to any social questions that were worth answering anymore. The more important and more pressing political social questions seemed to hinge on, on uh, black and white. Sinatra's song was one of tolerance, but the line that sang of my neighbor's black and white was cut from the film. So long, man. <laughs> European immigrants were learning that whiteness was more than skin color. It was the privilege of opportunity, and above all, exclusive. There's this whole very standard narrative of the European mobility model. We came here with nothing, we worked hard, we, we pulled ourselves up by our bootstraps. And it's offered up as proof of the openness of the American economic order. Left out of the bootstrap myth of European ethnics was access to opportunities close to non-whites. Roosevelt's New Deal reforms offered many Americans a path out of poverty. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 50 millions of our citizens. But the original social security program excluded farm workers and domestics, most of whom were non-white. And many unions locked blacks and Mexicans into low-paying jobs or kept them out altogether. <coughs> but perhaps the best example of how European ethnics would finally gain the full benefits of whiteness came with an innovation in housing at the end of World War II. It was a time when hundreds of thousands of GIs came home ready to start families but had no place to live. Living space was at a premium. When in the Bronx, they tried building Quonset huts and they turned to, to slums. All the Quonset huts had uh, just uh, disintegrated. There were two families sharing a hut. One family at one end, one family at the other. And before you know it, they were, they were awful. FHA came to the rescue by ensuring long-term, low-monthly payment mortgage loans. Veterans needed homes for families. They turned to a revolutionary New Deal housing program. It would racialize housing, wealth, and opportunity for decades in ways few could have imagined. In the 1930s, the federal government created the Federal Housing Administration, whose job it was to uh, provide loans or the backing for loans to average Americans so they could purchase a home. Due to the simulation of the National Housing Act, from every section of the country come reports of vastly... In order to purchase a house in America prior to 1930s, you had to pay 50% of the sales price up front. The new terms 
uh, purchasing a home was that you put 10% or 20% down and the bank financed 80% of it, not over five years, but over 30 years at relatively uh, low rates. This opened up the opportunities for Americans to own homes like ever before. The average person could own that home. If these terms sound familiar, they should because this is essentially the same financing scheme that allows most Americans to own their homes today. Federal programs and banks sank millions into the home construction industry. Their message to veterans, you can afford a new home, buy a new home now. On the outskirts of Baltimore, Memphis, Chicago, Los Angeles, Denver, and other cities. Brand new communities sprang up. One of the most famous was a Long Island potato field, transformed into 17,000 new homes. It was called Levitt Town. Tax dollars helped make the single family home a mass produced consumer item. The American dream had a new name, suburbia. You have to remember the people who came here in 1947, 1948, were young ex-GIs whose uppermost concern was taking advantage of the GI Bill and making things better for themselves. Before moving to Levittown, Herb Callisman and his wife Doris lived in a cramped attic apartment in New York City. And when we began to look for an apartment, we found that the apartments were $100, $125, $150 a month. I know that's unbelievable today, but it was too expensive for us. And out here in Levittown, the mortgage payments were $65 a month. If you were buying a leather home in 1947, 48, 49, 50, and 51, you would get, this would be your kitchen. You would get a GE stove, GE refrigerator, and a Bendix wash machine. It would be part of the real estate. We came to Levittown and we found the model house and we walked in and we looked around and uh, of course in the eyes of a uh, young man who was raised in the ghetto so to speak it was an interesting experience, interesting lifestyle, seeing all the new modern conveniences, very fascinating. Eugene Burnett came home with almost a million other black GIs. They had fought for the country in segregated ranks. They returned hoping for equality and the American dream. For many, that dream was a new home for little money down and some of the easiest credit terms in history. I went up to the salesman, we're interested in your home, we're interested in buying one, and uh, what is the procedure? Is there an application to be filled out? So forth, so he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. It was as though it wasn't real, you can't imagine. But for someone to come out and actually tell you that they can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on an up, oh, man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families could undermine real estate values in the new suburbs. These government guidelines were widely adopted by private industry. 
Brace had long played a role in local real estate practices. Starting in the 1930s, government officials institutionalized the national appraisal system, where race was as much a factor in real estate assessment as the condition of the property. Using this scheme, federal investigators evaluated 239 cities across the country for financial risk. So that those communities that were all white, suburban, and far away from minority areas, uh, they received the highest rating, and that was the color green. Those communities that were all minority or in the process of changing, they got the lowest rating and the color red. They were redlined. As a consequence, most of the mortgages went to suburbanizing America, and it suburbanized it racially. The racial logic adopts the principle that an integrated neighborhood is a bad risk, is a financial risk, that an integrated neighborhood is likely to be an unstable neighborhood, uh, unstable socially, but therefore also unstable economically. So I debated whether or not I would start our first class with this video and lay it all out um, so that we, this, the conversation started this way, but I did not go that route and <clears throat> we're talking about it tonight. And I would love to hear feedback on that, on that thought. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this video, we just watched how Supreme Court decisions, and I want you to know those two Supreme Court decisions that we put up were unanimous decisions. All right. um, led to loss of citizenship, taking of land and property, and distributed property to white farmers in particular. We saw how communities developed, how communities were redlined, how investment was incentivized or otherwise how lending practices led to wealth creation or wealth stagnation. And so when we are, I mean, you, there are people out here who are practitioners, who want to affect policy. The intentionality that led to the structures that are in place, it, it requires the same level of intentionality to change those structures that are in place. So if you're thinking about lending or development, you have to think about what structure, again, these realities are, were not created by accident. And when we look at agriculture in particular, again, in the 45 years following the Civil War, former slaves and their descendants accumulated 15 million acres of land across the U.S., predominantly in the South. So in 1920, in 1920 there were 925,000 black-owned farms which was about 14% of total U.S. farms. By 1975, that number totaled 45,000. And today, only 2% of farms and 1% of rural land is black owned. So you also read today about the Pigford settlement. And what you read was that between 1990 and 1995, the largest USDA loans went to corporations and white male farmers, that loans to black males averaged 25% less than those given to white males, and that 97% of disaster payments went to white farmers, while less than 1% went to black farmers. Again, it's intentional. In fact, there was a, a quote in, in the video that it's public policies and individualized actions that define race and, and impact reality. And here you have the United States government through the Farm Services Administration determining which farmers were going to have access to resources and which would not. And then when we look at who is harvesting uh, our food on the overwhelming majority of white farms, um, We know that 
70 to 80 percent of our farm labor are immigrants. And even though the official stat is roughly about 48 percent are unauthorized immigrants, the accepted industry number is about this closer to 75 percent. 72 percent of the folks working in our fields are male, and nearly 95 percent come from Mexico. And something that you heard in the video that sort of got glossed over. In 1938, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, which establishes the minimum wage, record keeping, child labor standards, and overtime pay eligibility. It, excludes far, it excluded farm workers and domestic workers, and it still does. Right? So in the materials that you had for today, you saw this slide. And this is research that we put together at uh, Grow NYC and, and Green Market in specific to look at the proposed legislation in New York that's probably been for the last 12 years the Farm Worker Fair Labor Practices Act. And it would establish minim a minimum wage. Actually, a minimum wage is already established in New York. It would establish overtime, the right to organize, a weekly day of rest, and other benefits related to housing, um, unemployment, you know, and mind you, this, this would not, still not apply to undocumented workers. It's only folks that are here that are legally author, uh, authorized to work um, in the United States. So our most vulnerable uh, farm workers would still remain unprotected. And when you look through this, look through which states actually provide a minimum wage. I think only f only five states in the United States provide overtime for farm workers. It ranges in the hour, uh, uh, in over 40 hours, 60 hours, or 48 hours. Some address seasonality. Uh, some state, about half state, half the states provide the right to organize or, or bar collective bargaining. Go through these stats. We don't have. We're not going to. We could spend. 10 classes on this. Extra credit assignment. In the documents that you have, we also broke down the impact on, the, you know, on an orchard, on a vegetable farm, I think on a dairy farm and on a livestock farm, of what overtime at 40 hours, 50 hours, and 60 hours would mean for the economics of those small farms. And so your overtime assignment, or, sorry, your extra credit assignment is to create a Farm Worker Fair Labor Protection Act that provides for overtime, that provides for collective bargaining, because it's a no-brainer that, that every farm worker should have fundamental rights that every other worker has, but also that keeps those small farms economically viable. So get creative and think about what type of financial offsets what types of bargaining rights those actual small individual farms have to negotiate their own payments to their buyers. Um, and then we can talk about that offline. And before I introduce our special guest tonight, there's a final overview slide of how the food dollar, or how the dollar is broken down along race and gender lines in the food chain. And again, this does not include, this does not break out for, for agriculture. And I, we, I, you heard earlier that women farmers actually are earning a higher income than, uh, than men. Uh, and so then you can even see further how skewed this is with the other uh, components of our food system. So with that, I want to invite Kiana Mickey. Oh, and we owe Kiana special gratitude. She presented on Friday in Philadelphia. Last night was the Just Food Gala, and it was phenomenal, but I know how exhausted Kiana is. Um, Kiana became the executive director of Just Food in May of 2017. She previously worked as the CSA network manager and most recently returned in September 2016 to serve as the policy and advocacy director Farmers Market Network Manager. She enjoys sharing the gift of learning, learner-centered trainings, cultivating community leadership, exploring the intersectionality of food justice, 
and advocating for sustainable and equitable food and farm policies on the local, regional, and federal level. Kiana, Kiana earned her Food Hub Management Certificate from the University of Vermont and her BS in Marketing from Hampton University. She's a member of the Alliance for Food and Racial Equity and serves on the Organizational Council of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. Kiana loves being an active CSA member of Stone Ledge Farm, practicing vinyasa yoga, and serves on the boards of the Point CDC, Revolutionary Fitness, and the South Bronx Farmers Market. So join me in welcoming Kiana. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I thought um, it was really important to to keep um, to this um, obligation because I think it's less of an obligation and more of an opportunity to continue to speak to multiple folks. Some I've seen and know in other um, places and spaces. Um, some folks are friends and comrades. Some folks are community partners, and a lot of um, are new faces here. But I. Um, when Michael gave me the opportunity to come, I didn't want to say no. I have a hard time saying no. Um, but I think talking about um, racial inequity and the importance of having that lens in food systems work and hearing um, um, what the students are in the class, it was really important to uh, make some time to come. So thank you. And I'm definitely going to ask for patience with me tonight. Um, I'm a wee bit fatigued. But, um, you know, it, it sounds like you've had a good primer. Um, it's a very sobering primer in terms of where to start when we're talking about racial equity or when we're talking about our history, and even with the lens of what policy. You know, for me, when I um, speak to folks, um, you know, I cannot start um, to talk about um, historical policy without acknowledging we're talking about agriculture policies based on stolen land. We're talking about land that was taken through genocide. Um, we're talking about land that was then used with chattel labor um, through slavery of black folks and genocide of indigenous folks in order to get this land and acquire this land. And then those bodies became capital. So if we're going to talk about policy, we have to at least be able to talk about where we're coming from. And for me, a good grounding point is acknowledging the land that we are here on right now. This is the land of the Northeast Turtle Island. This is the city of Kanono. Ka um, it it um, is the land of Lenape people. You know, the Lenape indigenous folks were here. I think, um, for me, I always try to acknowledge that and honor that. Um, I think when um, starting to just talk about my work and my inspiration is finding the importance of history and while it can feel really overwhelming, it's important to kind of work through and unpack it, to call it out, um, because then you'll start to see the historical systemic inequities. It's also important to hold concepts and push ourselves and understand that there are embrace of paradoxes in our life and in our work. So we can you know, want to hold what we feel are, makes us experts, what we took a class, so therefore we're an expert or we're fully educated, and then minimize the history lived experiences of folks. 
folks that have lost a lot of lives and livelihood to a process or to a struggle. So it's really important to really hold what is being an expert, what is education, and what is a lived experience, and those have value too. Um, so for me, that um, is a good leg, uh, segue into talking about that importance to my work um, and how I've been shifting just food and giving folks a little information about um, just food. And I can segue well. Yeah. So um, Just Food has a history of being a nonprofit food justice organization. We've been rooted <coughs> in um, the city, but our partners are within 250 miles. We've been around for 23 years. They've been on the vanguard of sustainable agriculture and food justice. Um, for me, being the ED in the past year and a half, I really wanted to shift our, uh, our center to be equity-centered. So equity is now our North Star. And when we do that, we really kind of speak and in, in support and amplify the work of our partners. Um, and historically, we've helped support and sustain CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture. How many folks are in a CSA? Oh, lots. Great. Um, Community-run farmers markets, urban um, trainings. Are anybody farmers market managers or operators? Oh, this is a good number. So, um, yeah, Just Food has a history in that work. But when I say, like, moving it to equity-centered, it's shifting from seeing our communities, so historically marginalized and under-resourced communities. That includes small to mid-scale farmers and producers, um, community members, leaders, um, eaters and growers, and activists, community chefs. It was shifting from seeing them as underserved, as communities of just deficits, as communities that needed all these um, inputs, and yet we're still seeing persistent um, inequities and hunger, health disparities, and at the same time expecting those communities to have no resources or little to no resources and still address these big inequities around health. Um, race, class, housing. And as you were hearing in the, um, the video earlier, how is it, you were hearing that these are purposeful things that were kept from them. People were redlined, people were kept from building wealth, uh, gaining land ownership, which we know is a core of building wealth in America, um, moving into spaces that were not well. So it's always interesting to, to me in my work to always continue to talk about how we're, the communities are underserved when we, without calling out that those communities have been purposely kept from capital and resources. So for, for us at Just Food, what I've um, shifted us to was trying to build the power, wealth, and health of historically marginalized and under-resourced communities. And I think the way to do that is fostering solidarity economy. Um, is that a term that folks are familiar with? Okay, good. I, well, not good that you don't know it because it gives me a chance to talk about it. Um, rooted in the viability of small, mid-scale, sustainable, regional farmers and producers. So when I say solidarity economy, um, I'm really trying to connect to what is already a global movement around building economies of um, wealth, resources, um, fairness, cooperative principles, and racial justice. Um, it's way more popular, I guess, internationally, but I think here is an opportunity for us to build for us and by us within our region and start here. So that's why I feel um, it really is rooted in the work of healthy food access, like CSAs and farmers markets. It's in supporting uh, small to mid-scale growers, where that is by you know increasing farm viability, but also keeping hold to that connection that there is a really rooted connection in um, security, food security, or folks being able to access and eat food, and have a determination of how and who grows their food, even if it's them themselves. So to me, it's kind of shifting from food security to food justice. And with solidarity economy, it's really the lived experiences and everybody who rose their hand. It's really the work you're doing now, but just having a term that really connects it um, together. So for us, you know, I think it then brings us to having a healthy food system that is really rooted in dismantling the injustices that we face, so then it can be actually rooted in racial, social, and economic environmental justice. 
when I first came into um, food systems work um, a couple of years ago around the last farm bill, there was not a lot of lens up here in the north around connecting race and economies to, um, to the farm bill. And I think as I've like grown on and integrated that into my, my work, I realize like it's all connected and that's kind of how they keep us separate. And that's how when you, and we can jump into that a little bit later, but that's how when you start talking about policies, how people will start to say like, SNAP shouldn't be in a, a, an agriculture bill. Why, you know, SNAP is only about poor folks, it, as opposed to talking about all the farmers that get um, money and it helps their viability when they're able to redeem SNAP at farmers markets or CSAs. So it's just, to me, another way that people keep historically marginalized folks against each other and try to split us apart as opposed to finding solidarity between our collective struggles so then we can actually build the power that was taken from us. Um, so um, again, sorry, jumping into back into a little bit about just food is um, just a quick slide about this. So again, I, I really feel like our work really should be at this point helping the most impacted become the most activated. Um, we have um, different programming around um, trainings, like um, community advocacy, how to start a CSA, how to start a farmer's market, um, resources that we're building out in order to make these um, relationships stronger, like a value chain map where farmers and producers and folks can increase awareness of their products, but also find ways to uh, partner with each other to sell um, their food and their products. Um, and other advocacy, and I think that's what I'm going to focus on tonight, is um, talking a little bit more about our um, policy and advocacy work. So um, I think um, equitable policies is really what we focus on and need to focus on. We're able to leverage our um, power and privilege as a nonprofit organization to engage on local, regional, and federal levels. Um, I also think it's important for us to increase the policy acumen and actual action of New York community members. So that looks like doing people power workshops throughout the city where folks, we kind of break down the local city government structure because we feel especially in these times, people were saying they wanted to be more activated and have more power. So they wanted to understand their government structure more and what power that they have beyond just voting. So we thought that we would create a training that would help folks um, see that a little bit more. I think that kind of helps connect to the local and regional things because when you start to hear policy stuff about this uh, sign this sign on letter or go to this protest or this action, it's just really important to know like there's different layers of action and, and activity that people can get into and that the closer we, you know, the, the closer we like, um, there's a divide in terms of information and access, and when we can close that gap, the more people who are the most impacted will actually have tools in order to be activated. So it's kind of not just saying that in words, but trying to find ways to connect people to policy so it's less esoteric or less distant, but more ways to be informed. So a lot of our work now has been this year in particular, <coughs> we kind of shifted in terms of doing work that um, does that either on a community level through info sessions, um, yeah, um, through info sessions and workshops, like I mentioned, and also around urban agriculture on the local level. There had been, um, there has been some movement around building comprehensive urban agriculture policy at the city level. Um, but what was there was a lot of folks that felt what was missing was a community-driven voice or an acknowledgement of the historical work done by mostly um, under-resourced and POC folks in community gardens and urban farms. Um, and they weren't really a big part of that policy. So some of um, urban ag leaders, like folks from Farm School and Just Food, New York City Community Garden Coalition, and some other folks started to get together to not just try to find ways to engage each other, but how to, uh, how to inform and influence community-driven policy recommendations and bring that up the chain to city council. So that was some work that we did throughout the, um, the year. And now that this is a farm bill year, we have kind of looked at how to increase racial equity and advocating 
um, through the path of the Farm Bill. So I think you had the Farm Bill talk, so I'm not going to jump too much into that, only to say that, as you know, that the Farm Bill is not authorized right now. And so this, I think, is a time that can feel very overwhelming in terms of where we are in the struggle. But again, I think when we have a racial equity lens to work, um, a lot, especially folks that come from communities of color, this is, this is the, I find, what I find strength is that this can be a pivot in terms of the larger struggle. And while it can, again, like just unpacking what can feel overwhelming because these are inequities that were persistently put in to keep us down, these can actually be moments where we can find new partners, new strategies, and new opportunities to kind of find opportunities in struggle to kind of move forward. And I think um, having a farm bill or being in a farm bill place like this, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, is where some opportunities are. So for me, when I want to think about how to move forward, I always try to tend to sometimes go back to history and find ways that have inspired me or to learn from lessons from historical inequities. So, um, you know, I talked about the you know, like in a frame that I try to, you know, root myself in, in terms of like land and where to start with policy. I think, you know, we heard and you see that there is, you know, persistent and systemic inequities. I think it's also to unpack that there's different levels to that. There's individual racism, you know, um, uh, institutional racism, systemic racism, and how they play differently with each other. Um, and I think, as you started to touch on, is that there is also racism and inequities in a long-standing history in our agricultural policy as well. These are, you know, rooted in history of exclusion, of true violence, um, and so much life and livelihood loss. Um, I definitely skip to here. Oh, yeah. So, you know. Again, when we kind of talk about land and we're talking about land ownership, we know that there has been this purposeful shift of wealth. Um, we, you know, had a land where it was, and for folks of color, of, of black folks, around 15 million acres, and then the, the number has gone down. And I want to talk a little bit about that power shift over time, especially when you have the lens of like Jim Crow. So you hear, when I mean, we sometimes think of the farm bill or policy, we only kind of hear it in this very like colorblind view. And like, the, you know, like farm bill is good. Farmers get, you know, payments and subsidies. Um, we want to support the land and conserve certain elements. But we don't really always talk about um, what was happening to folks that are already disproportionately marginalized. So when we're talking about land ownership, you know, we have things where these purposeful, inequities were keeping and taking people from owning and then shifting that power from land ownership to sharecropping and sharecropping to tenant farming. So you have less and less of an opportunity to own, more and more opportunity to be just labor. Um, so as these other you know policies are coming up, like the precursor to the Farm Bill, which is like their Agriculture Adjustment Act, while white ownership was going up, and that helped actually even conserve land, um, even at a time when there was environmental um, destruction of land, if there, at that same time, you had mostly black folks not owning land, but actually being sharecroppers, that means that that meant there was less land, if it's in conservation, there's less land to use. Less land to use means less land to farm, less land to actually make money, less land to actually grow food for yourself and your family, less land for you to make money to buy the things that you need. Um, and you know, and then that goes on. So you, we have, we go from like land ownership to sharecropping, to tenant farming, to farm, just being a farm hand. Um, Michael was kind of touching on it, then we, you know, this is farm hands, farm workers. So you really have, you're on this land, you're tilling this land, but yet you really have no true access or power to what happens to the land, to what happens to yourself and to your bodies, and how you're able to build wealth in those situations. And that is something that we see, you know, throughout history. But there is definitely a purposeful view there. Um, so even when you look at the timeline, um, like um, Michael offered earlier, where you can say in 1920, at like 
the time of the Great Depression. You had black-owned farms, um, ownership around 925,000. In 1975, just 45,000. In 20 cell in the ag census, down to 34,000. So again, like, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna mention some stats and some numbers. I am not a wonky person. I'm definitely not gonna be wonky tonight. Um, but I, even more than that, I just want folks to hear, especially when we are in class and we hear slides, when we hear things about land loss and, and opportunities lost or resources lost. Like, there are people behind these statistics. There are hearts and souls behind these statistics. There is blood on these statistics. People didn't just migrate easily and safely um, in the Great Migration. People were fleeing land knowing what, you know, full well that they were losing ownership and property, but wanting to leave because they wanted to survive. Um, so for me, I definitely want to, I can't like impress that, um, you know, enough. And, you know, so when we talk, of, when we see these stats about people who left and we talk about the migration and we talk about what they were facing in the suburbs in the north, um, which is important, we also still have to root ourselves in what was the survival tactics and needs and pressures that the people who stayed on the land were facing, even more so. Um, and, you know, in the, in having no really <coughs> access to policies to protect them, to support them, to, to help them survive or thrive. Um, I think, you know, for me, when I need to remind myself or ground myself in that and how important it is to connect to policy, because sometimes folks will say, like, policy doesn't affect me, it's so big, it's not really important, I don't get it, things just happen the same. It's really, for me, an opportunity to go back to lived experience that kind of speak to that story. So when, when I kind of get bogged down with statistics or just writing reports or building decks, something that I do is really try to take a breath and I kind of go back to stories like Fannie Lou Hamer um, and the cooperative bank and the pig bank that she built and holding and knowing that there was an opportunity in cooperative principles and, and trying to build black ownership and land was important for wealth and survival, knowing that she, her, just her personal story of being beaten just trying to vote, just trying to farm, losing that land because she was trying to farm is really important. There's many, many other stories. And a lot of those folks, um, there's a lot of stories and personal stories. She's just one that has been really speaking to me of, of late that I would encourage folks to read more about. Um, um, but, sorry, there's a skip in my notes. Um, and when, I, when I'm talking about these like personal stories or even historical stories, I think it's easy for folks, um, and certainly not in this class, but in other classes that I've been in, that people don't want to talk about race. People don't want to talk about policies, and we don't want to talk about how they actually still impact us now. Because this can sound very historical. This is the 40s, the 60s, and things in the past. But these issues really still um, find themselves in our current times. I, I think when I look around and I'm talking to folks about current farm bill policy, um, there's still these opportunities. Um, sorry, there's still these inequities that are abound. Um, one in particular you know, is something that I've heard from a couple of folks is even applying for grants. So now we've moved on where it's not discrimin you know, discriminatory practices. Maybe they're not going to throw out your grant application in, in the mail. You know, you put it in the mail and they throw it out once they get it. Like it happened to black farmers for years. They would literally get farm loans and throw them in the garbage and never look at them again. Maybe now that won't happen um, at FSA or USDA. Um, but think about, especially from a marginalized or a smaller scale capacity, even taking some a group like me, like Just Food, in a small organization. If we wanted to apply for a grant, like a community food grant, it's built, right, for community partners. It's supposed to fund community work. And I'm saying this in a trusted space, but this is a very actual um, thing. And I've actually tried to talk to some of the folks at USDA about this, is that 
there are still inequities that we face in terms of capacity, in terms of people not acknowledging, even in current policies, the under-resourced nature that many of us are facing. So, I, you know, I think of myself as an organization, I think of farmers that are, uh, you know, of color and just have two folks or a small um, group of folks of farm workers and farm hands themselves, um, trying to apply for these really complicated grants. We know that they're money, we know that they'll help us buy capital, we know that they'll help us do the work that we can do well, and yet at the same time you're faced with not really understanding the process, not having the time to do it, having to dedicate that time to just figuring out that grant or writing that grant or having that, that special or specific requirement or need to write grants well, and at the same time not having that capacity to be out in the farm. Same for me, if I am working on a grant that's easily going to take um, you know, a month and a half of my time, that's time that I'm not processing payroll or out in the community talking to partners to inform said grant. Um, a lot of times grants can come out at times when we're our busiest. I hear from farmers often that they would want to apply for certain grants. They can't because they're coming out when they're supposed to be in the field. I know I feel the same. If the farm bill was authorized, we'd be probably hearing about the community food security deadline for this year, and it comes out at some of the busiest times for nonprofits that work with farmers and community leaders. And sometimes you just don't have the capacity. So when folks say that these are, and I've had these conversations with folks, and I've he heard from other people, sometimes we sit there and you look and you're like, this would take three staff, a month and a half of doing nothing else, and still might need to figure out somebody else. Oh, and the matching element. All these, you know, all these little things that you would never say on paper keep you from this money, and yet keep you from this money. So then, when you look and you see that bigger groups and organizations get that, get those opportunities, you feel like you can't. And then sometimes you literally can't. And then you don't apply. You don't apply. You don't have access to those funds. And yet they'll say. It's open to community groups, and it, other people can get them. I don't know why you could. Oh, and it just took them three more years to apply. And I use that as an example of myself, because I don't mind putting myself on display, but I know farmers that have gone through similar experiences with their own um, programs that they want. So I'm, I don't want to say that we shouldn't apply for things. What I'm saying is that we definitely need to support each other in applying for, you know, connecting with each other and um, building our resources and opportunities to work together. So maybe we're applying together or supporting programming that will help each other. Um, because if we try to do it alone, it's purposely built for us not to be able to. And I think that that's, um, while that is still kind of an inequity that is still within policy, again, I still see that there's opportunities. So at the same time in the past, you had farmers in particular um, black farmers, but there are also, just like there's Pitford, there's other class action suits with indigenous um, farm, farmers, um, Asian farmers. Um, there have been opportunities from there, and all the, even with those inequities and even with those struggles that those past farmers felt, things like um, Pitford open the opportunity to get resources and money put into other programs. <coughs> so even within the Farm Bill, there is um, a program that came around called 2501. Is that a policy people are familiar with? 2501? So it's called, it, people use the vernacular 2501. It's the section 2501 in the Farm Bill. It is um, funds that are directly for socially disadvantaged farmers. Um, I will use quotes for that. Um, and now veteran farmers. So um, a lot of policy folks say that that is um, a win within the struggle because those funds were allocated specifically for socially disadvantaged farmers that had faced past inequities and had um, their farm loans thrown in the trash or um, their history once you apply for a loan, they now have all your information and then they would use that information um, against you and not give you the loan, but yet tell other farmers about it. Um, so all of those, um, we will never be able to equate the inequities or the loss um, of farmers or the loss of land, or the loss of money, but there have been some changes in policies that have come to help with that. 
And I think 2501 and what I hear from black farmers is they feel like that is a program that has helped in these past couple of years to kind of help address some of the inequity and have um, access to some funds. Um, I think now in current farm bills, <coughs> some of our like potential gains is um, protecting 2501, um, um, protecting other programs like Beginning Farmers and Ranchers Development Program, because it helps um, new farmers um, access to training, um, and, yeah, access to training and programs. Um, I think supporting um, programs like SNAP um, are opportunities, even though we know like SNAP is going to be um, attacked. Um, so um, when I think about, when I say opportunities, sometimes people look at me funny when I have farm bill conversations and we say opportunities. So it's like, how is that an opportunity if you know it's going to be attacked? How is it an opportunity if you know they're not funding it? How is it an opportunity if right now, the, the, if these programs are, are a rule the exception of SNAP, but things like Beginning Farmers and Ranchers, 2501, since they don't have baseline funding, those programs are not going to continue with funding without a new farm bill. So if we're in this unauthorized farm bill state, how do we, how does that feel like an opportunity? And so for me, I feel like it's an opportunity, um, again, to build solidarity, to really find amongst ourselves who, um, how to build new strategies, how to build new champions. A lot of times when you hear people talk about policy, they'll talk about, you know, the northern states are really focused on SNAP, and the southern states are focused on land, and that's where the farmers are, are in the Midwest. And I think we're missing opportunities there, because I think even within that, there are smaller groups and pockets of partners that can support each other. So for example, if we look at our region, uh, we have a lot of regional farmers up north um, or around us within 250 miles. We also have growers in our five boroughs. If we know that a lot of those farmers are bringing food to our communities, through CSAs, through farmers markets, even through some of the um, other delivery options or share and food boxes. Um, we know that we need them to stay farmers. We need them to stay on their land, and in order to do that, it's supporting their viability. Um, when, it, when we think about it in that way, then there's an actual linkage, and then we can actually connect from the urban to rural. So we're no longer just farmers and eaters, we're actually a community that support local food and want to keep that going. We want to know where our food is coming from. We want to know who our farmers are. We are committed to them staying on their land so they can grow the food that we want to eat. And we also know we want more people to eat that food. So to me, when these are again like opportunities. So instead of just hearing like only talk to this senator or when you're doing certain grassroots action, talk to them about just land, or just now, I think we should actually be using these as opportunities to talk about both. I live down here in 10026. I'm an eater, I'm a supporter of local food. I know that my farmers live in the Hudson Valley. I know that my CSA is rock steady. Um, they're in Millerton. I'm gonna call, you know, I can now call about different policies and programs. We're not just food and it's not just agriculture, they actually are connected. Um, similar to SNAP, um, how many folks, and especially the ones at farmers markets, felt like their community members were impacted when the Novadia issue happened and SNAP was almost not um, accepted? How many people heard or saw that they had members that probably were gonna question where they were gonna get food? All right, yeah. Um, I have partners, since our partners are small to mid-scale, um, it was not only going to impact the farmers that come down, but it was going to impact community members, um, eaters, even just people who walk by and want to use their health box, want to use their CSA. But what I started to find out even more was that wasn't just an issue at the scale that we know of, but there were even communities that are even more vulnerable or smaller that were going to be even more impacted and didn't even know that that change was happening. Didn't know that the equipment had shifted. Didn't know that there might need to be another shift if, if um, the money hadn't come through. 
And it really kind of made me realize, or not realize, but it reminded me how important it is to not just talk about policy, but to continue to be informed by the most impacted to ensure that we're informing the change that's needed. So when I when we were talking about protecting SNAP or you know protecting farm viability, it was really to be able to say there are folks in Bushwick that this farmers market is going to shut down because 90% of the people who eat who buy at that market use their SNAP benefits there, and they need to not only not lose their SNAP not lose their farmer, but they need to have equipment that they can afford to continue to use it. And it's interesting, and this might feel like a slight tangent, but even talking to folks at the grassroots level, when we were talking about SNAP, and I was talking about how many of our partners, my partners in particular, were going to be impacted, so many of them, who are very intentional and very engaged in policy, didn't even know that there were still farmers using vouchers to collect their SNAP benefits. There were, um, they, they didn't even know that there were folks that hadn't switched to the Novadia equipment. Because these folks are in communities that are so deep into the ground that they don't have the chance to always be at that Farmers Market Alliance meeting or be on that call for NSAC or even be on, check the email that Just Food sent out. They're just doing the work. And I realize, again, like these are the, when we talk about policy, when we talk about how it impacts folks, that there's, there's always another layer of folks. There's always people behind the statistics, and there's always more that we need to remember and know. And at the same time, understanding what their needs and, def not deficits, what their needs are, can actually inform what are solutions moving forward. So everyone gets um, involved or everyone also is informed by the policies that we want to see. And so when I talk about solidarity or when I talk about using these as opportunities, it's building new strategies that you're trying to push yourselves when you're doing your work or when you're thinking about doing policy, that policy happens on the daily level. Policy is food, policy is action, policy is building strategies with each other just to stay informed. That is policy work as well. And the more you have a racial equity lens and you value these communities, you don't, they, there's less opportunity for you as an individual to minimize, to marginalize, or forget that they have actual struggles. Um, and I think when we think about that, and we are, we're able to build new champions, you know, because at a certain point, you do need champions that are these elected officials that are going to make these decisions. And you want to be able to get those solutions that you've thought of, you know, from the ground up to that table. So it's leveraging each other's collective strengths to know how to engage with policy, but making it more nuanced and authentic to really serve, like, a larger population. And um, I think, too, it becomes, a, you know, a, continues to become a conversation of um, thinking about what are you doing this work for? Um, who's best served? Who's missing from the table? If you're talking and you're setting a table, who's here and who's not? Who is um, going to be most impacted? And can you authentically engage with those communities? Are you just dropping in or are you just saying you're speaking for them? Are you truly being informed in your work? Are you truly finding ways to engage folks? and bring them to the table. Not just to tokenize them or show them off, but to truly be engaged on how we can have more equitable policy. And to me, that's really being representative of all of us and our struggles. Um, and seeing um, resources in our communities already. Um, one example that I will share, do I find, yeah. Um, one example I'll share <coughs> and leave folks with is when I was at NISOG, I did a policy pre-conference, and we kind of did some small group. And this was, if this was a smaller group, I would have segued into doing small group work. But what we talked about was um, taking an issue around connecting policy to culture. People were saying like their work was rooted in community access, in food, and culture, and they didn't feel like that was um, really evident in policy, and yet wanted to connect to policy. So we did some strategies around defining assets in our community that already exist, seeing ourselves as assets and resources. 
And the more we kind of talked about that and pushed back on it, because there were some folks that were just like, you know, this is just deficits, deficits, deficits. Somebody said, like, I can, we can actually talk about this. She did work around fisheries and, and fish um, in the Northeast, and she was saying that there's a lot of fish that people call trash fish, right? We, is that a term people are yeah. familiar with? Trash fish. Well, who's actually defining what, the, what fish is trash? Why is it trash? For many communities, that is actual valuable protein. So that's one. Now you're, now you're, you're, you know, when you have a racial equity lens, when you value cultural relevancy, when, when that's a value as, as much as everything else, you start to see that you don't even think about the language you use, therefore you don't really think about the resources you have. So what is something that could be thrown away or is only being used for compost or you're not even eating the whole fish or thinking about how, yet there's communities that actually do. So maybe if there's that fish is already being culled and harvested, there might be communities that want to buy that local fish. And when you think about that, who are those communities that tend to do that? In her, in her, in her example, those were communities of color. Um, she mentioned Caribbean communities that want that fish that is so-called trash. It's not trash at all. And there, here you go, folks that are already seen as a poor community, which is a word I try not to use, that with trash fish that nobody wants, and even in just that one brief chain and example, you've gone from supply and demand. But now how do you connect that to policy? Well, there's value added producer grants in the, in the farm bill. Not a lot of folks of color apply for that grant. This is an opportunity on the local level that you're, well, it's a federal bill, but you can, on a local <coughs> level, be able to identify and make authentic relationships in a community that would value the resources that you have. Now you've built a chain. Now you have a further connection. And when she was giving this example, she was saying these communities are not that far from each other. So now you've just brought in potential job creation, you brought in transportation, you brought in aggregation, you brought in community relevancy, access and culture, commerce. So when earlier on when I said solidarity economy and everyone was like, I don't know what that is. That is what it is. That is again, seeing our work is the lived experience, valuing our communities and the resources that we have. It's not going to be the only thing. That's the base starting to find how we can build enterprise, entrepreneurship, opportunities within ourselves, and then leveraging policies, leveraging solidarity and collective power to access more resources to make our work stronger. And to me, that is a closer connection of policy. So I didn't say this earlier, but when we talk about policy and race, I think people are always like so down because it feels so heavy. And the reason why I wanted to end with that is I wanted people to leave feeling that there is opportunity and energize and also pushing yourselves to think about when you go into your work or into your lessons, how you can approach, be, increase your authenticity and your racial equity lens with this work, no matter what your avenue is, no matter what road it takes you. And hopefully that opportunity will be inspiring and you won't end on such a down note talking about racial equity or, and, or feel less encumbered to do so, but actually be inspired and push yourself to talk through it. So I hope that was interesting and informative. <laughs>
really, really, really good. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thanks oh, for you guys did a great yeah. job. It was awesome. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Really yeah. excited. Oh, oh, post, when I post about it, I'll tell you. Oh, yeah, it was, it was like, oh, I know exactly. I got everybody's photos. And oh, it's cool. Was your with you photographer and your got everybody's hashtags yeah, and that was in your great. Insta story. Mm. Can I access, does your photographer have that information written down? I That's a question. I think we're trying to figure out. Because that takes, like, hours to come with everybody's tags. I don't know if I'm going to get it all. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, I can't oh, save it. Yeah, I can't save it. Oh, I think I'm working on it today. So I, if you follow up with me, you might be able to.